Oh, just okay. Well, <laughs> hi, hi. How's it going? <laughs> Good. How are you? Good. Um, I'm Julie, and I'm Leah, and we have Chief with us, but Chief stepped away. I am here, moment. ladies and gentlemen. Oh, sorry, you? there he is. There he is. Go ahead. I'll let you do your thing. What what thing? Oh, what are we doing? Oh, today hey, today we have two special guests. Right now, we're just waiting on our first guest. There might be some technical issues. I'm not sure. As a matter of fact, I might put you guys on mute and call them really quick on his cell to make oh. sure everything's okay. all right. Okay, you can do that. Um, we'll just talk. Yeah. Let's, ladies, let's just I'm gonna chit -chat. I'm gonna I'm gonna put chit -chat. you on mute to make sure everything's okay while I call them. All right. All right, Chief. All right, Chief. Um, please go ahead and talk about our upcoming guests. We have some awesome. Great guests coming up. I'm super excited. We even have one next week, July 10th, right? Big time. Is that is that public? Is that for public yet? Is that? I, I, it it is. is public. I mean. All right, then you go ahead, ladies. Surprise everyone. I'm gonna make this phone call to our guests. Make sure everything's all right. Okay. All right. Well, first, I want to say, Leah, I really like your dress. Well, thank you. I got I this out the of same, exchange. I have the same dress. <laughs> You should have worn it. Why not? Well, I doing? honestly, I've gained a little COVID-19 and I don't know if it's going to fit. So oh, I, I'm just going to stick with this today. So <laughs> <laughs> so today we have Todd Robinson lined up, right? That's who we're hoping will be able to join us. We also today is a twofer. So who's our other guest? Our other guest, it, guest, why can't I talk today? Oh my gosh, is Vaughn Gittin Jr. And he is a professional drifter. And I'm going to be perfectly honest and <laughs> just say that I had was not aware of professional drifting. And when I heard about professional drifting, I was like, is that like you just kind of go from like, like you roam from like place to place, like so you drift around and find a place to settle. But no, it's not. It's, it's a sport. So <laughs> we're, exci we're excited. <laughs> we're excited to have to have Vaughn with us later today. He's going to be a great guest. And you guys have a guest host. Somebody is filling in for me. So come back and find out. They have special stories about Vaughn. Yes. To share. And Leah, who do we have next week? We have really two. We have two great. Well, we have three guests. We have three guests next week. They're all great. We do. So we start the week off on Tuesday with Cedric McMillan. He's a bodybuilder and also serves in the army. Is that yes. right? That's yes. And we have him. We also have Sergeant Major of the Army, Grinston. He Matt. is on deck for Thursday of next week, but Friday. What is Friday? Friday is not a usual Chief Chat day. So no, it's a very about? special, it's a very special episode of Chief Chat, but you're not gonna want to miss it, especially if you are a fan of football because we have one of the biggest names in the mf the nfl he recently came out of retirement he's going to be with us on friday thanks to our friends at png he is you guys want to try to guess Does breaking news guess? this is breaking breaking wanna, news i don't know if anybody's watching because our um you know, people are watching so we have some great. people watching people watching so you guys want to guess maybe who's going to be on with this friday just see if you can guess NFL just came out of retirement. Was also a contestant on The Masked Singer this past season. She Shelly. <laughs> Shelly, who do you think it is? Shut up. No, Written? it's not. Oh, Witten. Is, is she meaning Witten? Yeah. Is it not Tom Witten. Brady? Not Tom Brady. Teammate of Tom Brady, maybe. <laughs> yes, it might be a teammate of Tom's. I talk about him like I know him, Tom. I don't know. I know Sandy knows. Are you Sherry? Gonna... Sh Sherry is also asking if it's Witten. It's not Witten. That'd be great, though. Sounds like a lot of people Witten. are really up for ha us having Witten. We should try to make that happen. Yeah. Let's hey, ladies. Know. You know, it always. Uh, you know, we always have some technical difficulties, but I think he's in the waiting room. Could you check to see? It, oh, it's just Sandy or. It should say Sandy awesome. or, or it does. Okay. It does. All right. we'll admit. Say, Robert, we got you. Okay. We'll put you in, all right. Our guest is here. Our guest is here. And y'all just no you guys will just have to stand by for who okay. our special guest is next week. We'll tell you later. Hmm. <laughs> Keep checking. Check the Facebook page. 
Yep. Check, check, double check. <laughs> so did we, hey, did you guys name our guest? I don't think you can Who say it? that. Who is it? <laughs> we haven't you, said yet. We're not, yet. we're, we're, we're not saying it yet. Oh, intro. Okay. okay, so he, I think, is in the waiting room. We just need to get him to please unmute. Can you un unmute? Mr. Robinson, we need your camera and to unmute. Uh -huh. there Hello. There now we need your mute. You need to unmute, unmute. yourself, sir. Can yeah. you hear? Wow. There you go. Got you. All right. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> nice, Good morning. To, nice to be with you guys. I'm sorry that was a little complicated. It's okay. <laughs> All good, sir. Yeah, Trying to we're get it out of the light here. Give you. How's that? Yeah, it looks good. You look good. We can hear you. All right. Excellent. Chief. Let me get this started. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone out there in Facebook land. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Lewis Reyes, and I am the Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Exchange. I was going to switch it up for uh, um, Julie's mother-in-law, Mrs. Mitchell, because she says that guy always starts the interview the same way. So we switched it up by, by providing you some details as to what's coming up. All right, Miss Mitchell, so you got that here <laughs> first, but we have a special guest today, but before we get to him, let me introduce my co-hosts, Leah Matthews and Julie Mitchell. Ladies, how are you doing today? Good. Hello, doing good. All right, let's, hey, let's get this going. We're a little behind. Julie, you mind introducing our guest? I would love to introduce today's guest. We are so honored to have him. What's up with the 4th of July, just two days away? We wanted a guest with a strong sense of patriotism. We found the perfect one. Today's guest is the Hollywood director and a big supporter of our nation's service members and military families. His latest film, The Last Full Measure, hit theaters earlier this year, telling the heroic legacy of Vietnam veteran and Purple Heart recipient, William Pitsenbarger. Please help me welcome director Todd Robinson. Good morning. Good morning, Todd. Thanks so much for joining us. We're really excited to have you on. Um, for everybody watching, thanks for joining us and let us know where you're watching from. Leave some love. Any questions you have for Todd, we'll be reading those throughout the broadcast. Just let us know what your questions are. And then now is a good time to start your watch party if you want to enjoy this with your friends. But also, like we've talked about all along, follow us on Facebook. You will know who's coming up on the next Chief Chats, and we have great guests lined up. So follow us. Well, hey, Todd, thank you so much for joining us today. It's terrific to meet you and have you here with, you know, the military community. How have you been? Where are you at right now? I see it looks uh -huh. like you're in your house, but where are you at? How have you been holding up? And what are your plans for celebrating the 4th of July? Yeah, I'm good. Um, everything's well. I'm actually up with friends in, uh, in, uh, outside of uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, in a small town called Alpine. And uh, I'm actually celebrating it with, a, with quite a few former military guys um, and gals. And um, we're just up here kicking back, taking in the mountain air and having a good time. Good. I'm glad you guys are getting a chance to kind of relax and uh, maybe get your mind off things that have been going on this year. I know that the film industry, it's been hit hard during the pandemic. What's changed for you during this time? That's a good question. We're not even really clear about what's changed fully. Um, you know, making films is a, a contact sport, if you will. We're in close proximity of each other all the time, uh, you know, especially uh, actors and actresses working closely with makeup and hair, um, camera people getting close, uh, you know, measuring focus and things, you know, we're all very close to each other. So the guilds are currently in the, in the, the business of sorting all this out and trying to figure out um, how we're going to actually do this in terms of having safety officers on set, quarantining our crews and that sort of thing. And it's, it's tough because if, uh, if you're quarantined as a crew, you can't go home and see your families and so forth. So we're not exactly sure how it's all going to come back together. Um, it looked like it was coming back together. And then we've had this uptick uh, in the virus. So um, we're sort of back on our heels again. Good. Thanks for sharing that. You know, hopefully everything can continue um, like you guys have been. And know you have a passion for storytelling. You've written and directed a number of films, including Phantom and The Last Full Measure, both military stories. 
Do you have a connection to the military? What draws you to bringing military stories to life? Well, I think military stories are an excellent place where uh, stories of heroism reside, stories of uh, sort of the, the, the unknown, entering into the unknown world, the unknown jur journey, um, the stories of initiation. Uh, it's a really good place to find those things and, and see how people are transformed by their experiences, um, you know, among strangers in highly stressful scenarios. And so um, it, it happens to be a really uh, sort of low hanging fruit for storytellers. Um, but I became involved in the military really quite by accident. Um, I happened to be a civilian pilot. And because of that, I started getting called in for the sort of military stories in Hollywood because uh, they knew that I could write that dialogue. Um, but in my other life as uh, an avid uh, amateur pilot, I've come across a lot of folks that are uh, former military aviator, you know, naval aviators, uh, Air Force pilots and so forth. And they have sort of trained me up and brought me into the culture. And so uh, I've just met a lot of veterans that way. And then uh, I've also become acquainted closely with the pararescue community. Um, and I just love those people. They're, they're true heroes. Um, and so sort of the, all of those things sort of as an amalgam is, is the way I, I, I came into it. And um, they, these stories sort of keep choosing me as opposed to me choosing them. Wow, that's, 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 that's awesome. Oh, hold up, am I on mute or am I, hold on. Oh, we can hear you. Oh, we can hear you. Yeah, right, you I thought I had it on mute. No, you sound good. In the background noise. Hey, Todd, thank you for that. And I know, I know you love our nation's war fighters and their families, Todd. In fact, your movie, The Last Full Measure, was screened in advance for free to troops at Exchange Real Time Theaters. I think I have a list here of all the installations you went to. Lackland, Air Force Base San Antonio, Fort Jackson, Andrews Air Force Base, Travis, Vandenberg, Fort Hood, Schofield Barracks, Hickam Air Force Base, and West Point Academy. That's a lot of installations. And, and I was told you paid out your pocket to actually fly out to all these installations, to provide these free screenings, um, which is very impressive. And so I thank you on behalf of the, of the military service members uh, for that. So our heroes would love to hear some words of inspiration from you. What can you share with all of them? Well, I just think that, you know, what our fighting men and women are doing on behalf of the rest of us is difficult work. Um, but they need to know and understand that, uh, that we understand that, that our freedoms rise and fall on, on them doing their work effectively. And, um, you know, there are a lot of us out here who appreciate what they do. Uh, it's not just about uh, men and women uh, out there in country doing their jobs. It's about all the people back home um, who are keeping, uh, keeping the babies fed and, uh, and the bills paid and all of that. Um, uh, you know, our, our, our wives and husbands who are non-military, um, who are at, at home doing that work. Um, I don't think our warfighters could possibly do what they need to do without knowing that all those things are taken care of. So when we were touring the, the film, as you mentioned, uh, the military bases, uh, it, I got a chance to meet many, many of the, of the people on the home front. And uh, it became clear to me uh, just how much this story meant to them, uh, that, it that it was acknowledging the people in the field and the people at home, because the movie really sort of deals with, with both worlds. And, um, you know, it's just an honor to meet uh, these people from enlisted all the way up to four stars, you know, uh, there it, it's, it's really a, a, a fine community of, of working professionals and uh, to be a civilian and be able to peek into it from time to time is, um, is really special. So let's talk about the last full measure. Congratulations on the film. It was, it was phenomenal. Film starred some big names. You had Jeremy Irvine, William Hurt, Christopher Plummer, and you told the story of a Vietnam War hero. How did you learn about Bill Pitsenbarger and what can you, what can you tell us about him? Well, the way the story came together is that I had been hired to do another movie on pararescue um, that I was adapting a book by a guy named Jack Brim, who's a, a former PJ. And, um, and I had been invited over to Kirtland Air Force Base um, to see a grad. Well, actually, what happened was I, I toured all the schools in the pipeline over the course of about six months. And then I was invited to the, gradu the graduation of the class I had been sort of following around. And um, while I was there, Mr. Pitsenbarger had just sort of 
randomly been invited to dedicate a building to his son's name, uh, in his son's name. And I had heard about this story, uh, but I was already involved in another movie. And so I, I wasn't really looking at it as a potential film project. But when I heard him speak, it just really rocked me. Um, he was very ill at the time. He was dying. I knew that the effort to get him his son the Medal of Honor was afoot. It was before Congress. And when he got up and spoke about all the things he never got to experience with his son, um, it became, it really resonated with me, not only um, as, a, as a son who was just a little too young, I, I just missed Vietnam, but I had a son of my own at the time who was 12 years old, who is now 28. And uh, the idea of, uh, of losing my son in a war, especially like Vietnam, which seems so socially, um, you know, just in, in a state of flux and uh, the politics of that war were so complex. Um, you know, how would you wrap your head around, you know, losing a child to a war like that where the, the protocols and uh, the politics were so confusing. And when I saw this man's pain, I just knew that there was a story to tell. And I wanted to then, and so then I became involved with the veterans who were actually trying to get the medal uh, for Pitts and became friends with them and then became <laughs> overly committed to getting the movie made uh, with my partner, Sidney Sherman. And we thought that we would probably get this wrapped up in a couple of years and it ended up taking 20. So uh, it was a long haul and, um, but we got it done. And it, it's been really satisfying again to see uh, all of the, uh, the folks in the military, especially in the Air Force community, uh, see one of their own acknowledged uh, on, such a, on such a mass, in terms of mass appeal. And uh, we, were, we were pleased to do that. I'm trying to turn off all my gadgets here because we're all doing, <laughs> my apologies. I'm doing the same, okay. I'm doing the same. Uh, thanks, thanks for thanks for sharing that, Todd. Here's a here's a fun fact for you, right? Uh, funny, not a funny story, but you know, true story. So about I think January, uh, February, March time frame, I get an email from the second Air Force Command Chief asking, "Hey, could she, you know, could she get an advanced copy of the DVD, the last four measures, so she could show it for professional development training and everything?" And so I sent a, a note to John Walters, who works closely with the studios in Sydney, and um, and you know, they actually sent a DVD down there to Keystone Air Force Base. So they could watch it. Unfortunately, COVID hit really, really hard. And so it's been kind of difficult for them to kind of show the movie. But just in case you're wondering, the, the second Air Force CC, Chief Master Sergeant Joanne Bass, actually uh, was just, um, just chosen to be the next Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force and the first female. So in case you're wondering, Todd, she probably owes you a favor for sending her that advanced copy of the disc. <laughs> oh, well, how can I cash that in? I think I need a ride in a jet. Can you work that out for me? <laughs> so, hey, so if, uh, the future Chief Master on Air Force, Joanne Bass is watching. Uh, Mr. Todd Robinson might want to ride in the jet. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations to her. That's, a, that's quite an achievement. And um, uh, as my friends, my enlisted friends would tell me, we, we all know who really runs the, the military. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right so. here, the stripes. Hey, the stripes. Where the stripes at? Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> awesome, Todd. You're getting a lot of likes and loves on our Facebook stream. Just want to take a second to share some of that with you. Um, people are watching from all over the world. Um, we have Tinker Air Force Base. That's in Oklahoma. People are watching from there. Watching from Fort Hood, First Cavalry Division Museum. That's Sherry. We also have um, our Army family and MWR programs. They're watching and tuning in and they say hello. Um, Chief, have I missed anything? No, a lot of people just, you know, just saying they're in the house. You know, they're excited to, to tune in. Uh, yeah, just a lot of people just chiming in saying hello and a lot of likes and loves just keep popping up. Mm -hmm. Right on, well, I appreciate all of them and, uh, and all the, the hard work that they're doing. And I, I really hope everybody has a little chance to celebrate uh, our country this weekend. And um, we're going through some rough times um, right now on a lot of levels and we, we got to stick together. And um, we know that our military will, so carry on. Exactly.
You know, and as Chief mentioned, the last full measure was shown in exchange theaters, including several advanced screenings, which you personally attended. What was the reception like from the military audience? Well, it's interesting, you know, the, the military uh, experience of the movie was really quite similar to the civilian experience. It's a very emotional film uh, at the end. It's not a political film. It's not meant to be making a political statement. Um, but it, it's really a story about, you know, what is it that makes somebody do something, um, you know, amazing, you know, putting themselves in harm, harm's way. For those of your audience that don't know the story of William Pitsenbarger, uh, he elected in the middle of one of the bloodiest ground battles in Vietnam to volunteer to go down on a hoist from an H-43 Husky uh, and put himself in the middle of this true bloodbath. There were over 700 guns going off simultaneously. And once he got down there, he refused to return to the ship even when ordered to. And he stayed there. He fought alongside these men he did not know and eventually gave his life fighting alongside of them. And um, it's just a, an amazing thing to meditate on. Um, you know, what makes someone do that? What separates someone like that from the rest of us? And it really, you know, I think about this all the time because movies are really metaphors, right? We, we want them to sort of transcend the story themselves so that you can project yourself into that story and uh, ask questions of yourself. What would I do? Um, and in, in this case, when you, when you look at someone who had so much to live for um, and, and thinking, you know, what was going through his mind at that moment, uh, and it, it, if, you, if you are familiar with the work of Carl Jung, you know, he talks about the collective unconscious and this notion that in times of great stress, some people recognize on a very deep level that we're connected by something deeper than the color of our skin or our culture or whatever, it's, it's humanity. And in this moment, this, this young man connected with that, that thing and was, there was just no way he was going back. And he really delivered hope to these people on the ground who looked up and saw him coming down and they described him as like this archangel, either an archangel or a guy who was completely insane, you know? But, but the veterans on the ground from Charlie Company will tell you as they saw this guy coming down, they thought he must believe that we can get out of this if we just pull ourselves together because why else would he descend into this hell? Mm. And he really did rally them in that way. And they did fight and they did, uh, in spite of taking 85% casualties, they did complete their mission. They defeated the enemy in that battle. And um, much of that was, uh, was due to the example set by this 21 year old airman who was already the veteran of over 300 search and rescue missions. In the movie, I think the most powerful line that stood out for me, not to spoil the movie for those who haven't seen it was, and you just touched on this, is what the power of, the power of what one person can do. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that everybody watching can, can take away. You have the power, right? To, to change, to change things and to, to help others. Well, you know, it, it's, it, it, I'm glad that you picked that out because as, as we make films or as I sit down and write them, eventually it, what comes into focus is what it's really about. And once you discover that, then you realize what is really informing every scene in the movie. And that line um, it is really the, the go-to moment in the movie. Because if you think about it, it doesn't matter what you do in life. You could be a school teacher and there could be that kid that's sitting in the back of the class that you don't really even love. You know, Maybe he's got bad personal hygiene. Who knows what that kid's story is? But you hear this all the time where 20 years later, you'll get, a teacher will get a letter from that guy and it'll say something like, yeah, I'm now a head of neurosurgery at blah, 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 blah hospital. And I just wanted you to know that there was that day where you stayed after school and worked with me on my math. And it wasn't the math, it was that you made me feel self-worth. And I soldiered on and I achieved and accomplish things in my life. And I wanted to know that you were at, this, at the heart of that. And so we don't know in the moment when we're that pebble in the pond where those ripples are gonna go out. And at the end of the movie, um, there, it, there really is a visual way that we experience that without giving it away. 
um, where you get to see the effect that this one man in one moment had on several generations of people. And so when I leave a, a movie or when I, the audience leaves the movie, I hope that they'll consider that the next time they come on, uh, come upon a situation where they might be able to uh, exercise a random act of kindness that you, they may never know where that goes, but it, it, it really is, you know, that concept of karma. You can see that. I always think about this when I'm driving on the freeway, you know, in, in LA, you know, somebody cuts you in and, you know, you take it personally. But then I think, well, maybe that guy's wife just called him and she's on her way to the hospital to have her baby. And maybe if I knew that, I cut that guy some slack and throw a body block for him and let him in. And then I let him in. And sometimes that guy will let somebody else in in front of them. And all of a sudden you see a little bit of peace and harmony going on on the freeway. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but I think it kind of works that way in life. You know, If we can treat others the way we would like to be treated, um, with a little respect and, and looking at people's potential um, and, and trying to support that. Um, you just never know what effect you are going to have uh, on, the, on the planet that we live on. What makes The Last Full Measure different from other war movies? Well, I think, it's, um, I think it, it comes down to the fact that it's not really about winning a battle. It's really about uh, again, the, the humanity that this, this man exercises and how it impacts this group of men who needed to find purpose in their own lives again. And I, I should go back a little bit by saying that Pitsenbarger was killed in 1966. Uh, the army guys put him up for the Medal of Honor. It went all the way up the chain of command to Johnson and McNamara and was kicked back down as an Air Force Cross. And and almost 30 years passed and these guys all got spit out. There was no internet. People went by handles. Nobody knew who anybody, where anybody was. And with the advent of the internet, what happened was that the wives of these veterans started to make contact with each other and have these sort of virtual reunions. And that's when they discovered that he had never gotten the medal. Mm -hmm. And when they learned that Mr. Pitsenbarger was dying, he was dying of cancer, they realized that there was great urgency um, to, to petition Congress. And so they got a young man named Parker Hayes involved uh, at the Air Force uh, Sergeants Association and others, uh, Whit Peters, uh, Secretary of the Air Force. And they started to put a plan together to petition Congress. And this had really uh, gone far beyond the, the, uh, the normal uh, timing of what it would take to get a, mm -hmm. a, a Medal of Honor considered. And so what happened was, as those men came back together, um, they were able to re-experience their stories with each other. And they shared a lot of that with me, which was a, just a true privilege and honor to see them vulnerable and sharing that, that pain and that sense of loss. And, and then we got to sort of do that again with the making of the movie and they stuck with us for 20 years. It was really a painful process, but, now we're all friends. I've done a lot of media with a lot of these guys. And you really see that there, you know, you asked earlier about what the audience reaction, the military audience reactions were like. And I can't tell you how many, you know, wives and children of not only Vietnam veterans, but veterans of our current wars came, came up to me and said, this just broke something open for our dad or for our husband. And because communication is really the, the key to cracking post-traumatic stress that is not involved in, in either a, a medical problem or, or a, maybe a dependency problem, which are all symptomatic, right, of trying to numb the pain. And I actually happen to work, I'm on the board of directors for a group called Save a Warrior, which is a, an anti-suicide uh, group where we put 12 people at a time through a five-day cohort and get them to tell these stories one last time so that they can understand that, and this is a line in the movie, the war isn't who these people are, it's simply what happened to them. Mm -hmm. But our warriors don't always understand that. They feel like there's this separation that happens, you know, when we walk up to, to you all, our veterans, and say thank you for your service, something clicks in them and, and they, what they're thinking is, if you knew what I did, you wouldn't be thanking me, you'd be separating from me because war is 
absolutely horrendous thing to experience to go through. And I had to do things that I was never prepared mentally or emotionally to do. And so we get those men and we, and women too, we do women's cohorts separately. And we put them in a group where they can talk about these things in a safe space and be vulnerable. And it's just amazing what happens when they can actually talk about it. So the movie was re is really kind of a little mini version of that where uh, our veterans and active duty um, can sit there and have an emotional experience. And, and that opens up a conversation with their loved ones. And so that may be the most, uh, the biggest achievement of the film um, that, it, that it's opening up conversations. Hey, Ty, a quick question. How did you get such a, a star-studded cast to, to sign up for, you know, for your movie? I mean, I was kind of impressed. I was like, man, he's a lot of people I recognized, you know, around other movies. And I was like, man, he got some heavy hitters in here. How did you, did they want to be a part of the movie? The, you know, uh, how does that work? For for, I don't know anything about movies. To recognize a celebrity is huge, right? Because, you know, <laughs> yeah. a lot of times, who's this? So if you're recognizing these people, they're big names. Yeah, to me, yeah, I was like, well, man, uh, you, he pulled a lot of yeah. people in here. I don't know, how, how, do you, how does that work for someone who's not familiar with how the Hollywood process works? Well, it, all, it begins with the story. I mean, this is what's considered an independent film, which means that it wasn't backed by a big studio. Um, and that means we have to go out and raise the money ourselves, which is really difficult. Um, and then you have to raise the same amount of money all over again to promote and market it. So it's really difficult. So trying to get those guys off of their normal paycheck uh, is, is tricky, but it all starts with the story. And the story doesn't belong to me, it belongs to William Pitsenbarger and his family and friends. And what I did was I, I took that story and I adapted it to tell a bigger story, which is what we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. And when the actors read great stories with great parts, where they get to actually do something that's meaningful, um, they're immediately attracted to it. And uh, I'm pretty good at, if I can get in the room with them, um, convincing them to do it, that they'll be in good hands. And then, um, and then it's, it's just quite amazing. Um, you know, I think, I, I think William Hurt might've been one of the first people involved. And once you start getting these big stars involved, the, the other people just start to pile on because they go, well, it, it, it must be a, a good project if so-and-so is involved. <laughs> so it, be, it becomes a little bit of a domino thing but it was really difficult and challenging to get their schedules to all fit because uh getting them all in one place at one time is brutal because they're all so busy you know with other projects so but it all came together and i think we're i think we have three or four academy award winners in there and everybody's been nominated and there's just there's there isn't a slacker in the movie <laughs> i i actually agree with that I was very impressed. I was like, man, look at Samuel L. Jackson. I was, he pulled out all the guns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, Todd, I want to know a little bit more about you. I, I see that you're a professor of film production and thesis writing at the University of Southern California's prestigious School of Cin Cinematic Arts. What, what's that like? Um, and what advice do you have for maybe young, young people who want to go down that path? Well, you know, being a professor really only means that uh, they wrote me in because I've done this. You know, I'm not a trained educator, um, but I love young people. And, uh, and when you get a little bit older, you, you realize that you need to, to pass on what you know a little bit to the extent that it can be useful to people. Um, and these, uh, the students are smarter than I am. Uh, and I, I always learn more from them than I can possibly teach. But really what I try to do is uh, in my classes is I'm teaching a certain skill set about how to, you know, how to make a movie. At least that's what they think. But what I'm really trying to teach them are life skills. I'm, I'm trying to teach them leadership, uh, team building, um, and those kind of things in a business that is really uh, very ego driven and so forth. And uh, so it's not that dissimilar to the military where you have a common goal and everybody has to come together and uh, do their part. And it's a lot of little parts that come together to, to get a big result. And so, um, yeah, it's amazing. I, I love being in that uh, academic setting with, um, with just really smart students and really smart professors. And um, yeah, it's great. 
It's great. I love to do it when I have the time. So Todd, you mentioned leadership and team building. What kind of ad- advice do you have for, for just in general, what advice do you usually give these students? So our audience could kind of hear that and maybe, you know, utilize that, well, you know, those nuggets. I, the, all I can tell you is, I mean, I, I don't really know much. I, I just sort of know how I stumbled through my life and my passion uh, for making films always uh, sort of fueled uh, the inertia that I needed to stay with it. I'm a little stupid. I just keep banging my head against the wall until I either bust a hole in it or somebody opens a door, right? But uh, I, I like to use the, um, a, you know, a pilot analogy, which is, uh, you know, if you're flying an airplane, you got a parachute in it, and, and the, the plane catches on fire or a piece falls off of it, you're probably going to use a parachute. And uh, you'll hear a lot of people give advice, you know, always have a backup plan. And I don't abide by that. I think, uh, you know, if a piece falls off the airplane, you need to learn how to land it really fast, you know, because if you jump out of the air, if you jump out of it, you might survive, but the airplane's going to crash and maybe kill somebody on the ground. So uh, in, in my business, if you're in it, you got to be all in. And I think it's probably the same in the military. You know, you need to be all in and you need to understand that you're part of something bigger than yourself. And, um, and the other thing is I always try to give credit to everybody around me. Um, and I mean, you guys are all, you know, looking at me, I'm, I'm one guy sitting in front of a little camera, but I represent probably 600 people on this film that were required to get it done, not only uh, in the United States, but in Thailand and Costa Rica, in England, uh, Spain, all, all over the place, you know, to pull this thing together. And um, so, yeah, I mean, and that's part of the fun of it is, is working with such talented people and, uh, and, and having access to their skills. Um, so, yeah, I'm just kind of the guy that carries a flag. You know, there are a lot of really gifted and talented people that, um, that really make these things happen. And it's a, a privilege to work with them and to anybody who's interested in film or anything in life, whether you want to go into medicine, it doesn't really matter what it is you really need to be committed to it and to yourself and realize that you're going to get stomped on all the way along, all along the way. And you just have to keep getting up and keep getting up and try not to take it personally. Um, And I learned a lot of that, that from my friends, many of whom are coming up here today who are former military, when we go fly sorties, you know, you get debriefed at the end. And in the beginning, I remember thinking, you know, I, I was being criticized, you know, for my flying skills. And, um, and I, I, I thought, don't they know who I think I think I am? You know? <laughs> I mean, this is me they're talking to, you know. And uh, what you realize is that it's not personal. And, uh, and that, you know, just taste of military training that I've gotten has gone a long way to, A, not take myself too seriously in my own work and in my own life. And, and B, to realize that it's not personal, that I'm not being attacked personally. We know when we do these things, we don't even use our names. You know, it's like, hey, number one, hey, number two, um, you, depending on where you are on the flight. And that's to depersonalize it so that you can hear the, crit- the criticism and, and improve. Um, because there are other people's lives in your hands when you're flying in close proximity to other airplanes. And I think that's a great metaphor again for life, you know. Um, whether you're a parent or a teacher or a a boss, you know, you really need to take care of the people who are working for you. And if you do that, they'll take very good care of you. And the other thing that I always do is I always ask people, especially the young ones, the the PAs and the the personal assistants, I always ask them, you know, what's the dream? Who do you want to be when you grow up? Because I know it's not being my assistant, you know? And then I try to support that to the extent that I can, if they do a good job for me, if somebody wants to be near the camera, somebody says, I want to be a camera person and they're stuck in the office, I'll, I'll drag them out on set for a couple of days and, and find a way to get them back up in the office so that they get a taste of it, you know? And then I, what my real hope is that when they get in a, in a position of, uh, of privilege and leadership, that they'll pay that forward. You know, it's the only way we're going to get, get through it. Is if is if we see other people and what they what they want to do and who they want to be. I think uh, I think one of my bucket list items would be, I just want to be on a set to see how it all works, how the how the movie comes together. I think that would just be awesome to kind of experience and see it. Hey man, you got my number. I know I do. 
<laughs> so speaking of that, what's, what's ahead for you? What upcoming projects would you like to talk about? What can you share with, with everyone out there in Facebook land today? Well, I'm about half a million projects I'd like to do. <laughs> um, uh, I'm currently working on a, a, a pilot uh, that has to do with a private security company that does global uh, rescue of, uh, of uh, abducted children. And it's based on a real company. Uh, again, a lot of uh, former military people are, are involved. Uh, Mark Harmon is my partner on that, the actor. Oh, wow. And uh, we're putting together all of our, we do a lot of uh, pitch materials. We do sizzle reels and photo decks and things like that. And so we're in the midst of that. But it's been a, a little bit of a strange time with COVID because we're doing all these Zoom calls and it's sort of a little bit more challenging to uh, you know, push your passion through a, a, a computer screen and actually be in the room with people. Um, I have that. I have a couple of movie projects that I'm, I'm passionate about that, you know, they're all in various stages of, uh, of uh, development. So, but I, I think we need to sort of get through this health crisis that we're all in first and figure out what the protocols are going to be. And, uh, and then we'll get back, back in the saddle. So what, what is, uh, what is, um, Todd Robinson watch on TV. What movies? What what series? Well, I'll tell you what I'm watching? watching right now. I'm watching on uh, it's on Apple Plus, which is a, a new platform, newish platform. I'm watching the morning show. In fact, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a great big TV right behind me. And yes. uh, again, I got all these like military dudes up here, and at night, this is this is a, a show about mostly female protagonists, and it is awesome. Jennifer uh, Aniston has never been better. I mean, the girl from Friends, I mean, she is just slaying this thing, playing sort of this Katie Couric character. I don't know if you guys have seen it. No, it I've wanted to. I haven't I haven't had a chance to check that one out yet. Well, dial it in on your iPhone. I mean, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. I, I can't stop watching it. We, we're, uh, I think we're six hours in. There are only two hours to go and I don't know what we're gonna do when we run out. <laughs> So, but I'm uh, but I'm mostly a long form guy. I I um I love movies. I, I love being able to take that two hours out of your life and be being taken to some place that I've never been before, uh, and uh, just be sort of transformed, you know, in, by the experience of seeing the movie. Um, it's hard. Life is so busy, and there's so much content out there. It's 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 hard to you know even begin to catch up with it. So, so popcorn or milk duds? Oh man! Well, popcorn <laughs> if it's got caramel on it is real good. Caramel and peanut cluster is really good. Uh, but no, I would say I'd have to say I'm a milk dud man myself. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we got a question here from uh, Tim Meyer. He asks, "Oh, oops, uh, what directors inspired or inspire you?" Oh, great question. Um, you know, my generation of the guys that I really grew up with are, are guys in the 70s, I would say. So, you know, Francis Coppola, um, uh, Martin Scorsese, um, you know, th that sort of generation, that sort of little, there's a group of those guys that, that were all great friends and remain great friends, Spielberg, of course. Um, but, you know, the guy that gave me my break was Ridley Scott, um, who, oh, okay. you know, wow. Gladiator, among a million other movies. And he is truly one of the greatest uh, living directors, in my opinion. I, I remember uh, I, was, I was a theater major in college and I was doing summer stock one year and I, we were all exhausted and I, I just had to go to the movies. And I went and I saw a double feature of Days of Heaven and The Duelist, which was Ridley's first movie with uh, Harvey Keitel. And it, it's just a phenomenal visual experience. And, I stumbled out of that theater having seen these two masterworks, visual masterworks. And uh, I just thought to myself, I have to be involved in that. Whatever that is, I, I wanna be part of that. And I didn't realize it was gonna be as a filmmaker. I thought it, I was a, an acting major in college. I thought it would be as an actor. Uh, but within 10 years, Ridley was making my first movie called White Squall. And we traveled all over the world making that film. And so I would have to say that if there was any one person, it was Ridley because he was a guy that, you know, pulled me next to the camera because he knew that I wanted to direct. And, you know, it was just amazing to have a, a master filmmaker 
um, you know, spend six months of his life with me on his hip. And um, so, yeah, so Tim, I hope that answers some of your questions. How did, how did, uh, how did you, did you actually meet? How did, I know you said he gave you the break with the six months, but how did you actually meet? How did you guys come across? Oh, really? Well, you know, it, this is a great story. Um, uh, and I'll try to make it really short because it's really long. But <laughs> I was, I had written, uh, it, 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 it's a movie about um, a, a sailboat that ultimately capsized and sank with students aboard, big, tall sailing ship. And uh, when I went to my original agent with the story, she said, nobody's ever going to make this movie. It's period. It's, it's water. It's, it's never going to happen. So I, you know, skulked away. And uh, a guy named Michael Sipley, who was a producer at the time, he's still around. Um, he, he, I, I pitched the story to him and he said, this is great. And I'm like, no, it's terrible. It's, it's water. It's period. It's, it's never going to happen. He said, no, no, no. Trust me. He said, go home, write two pages on this and send it back to me. And Michael had worked for the LA Times as a writer. So when he got my pages, he said, this is great, but kid, you buried the lead. Can I rewrite it? And I said, okay. And he, he reorganized it and I read it and I went, wow, I got it. He put the hook at the beginning. And we sold it with my other partner, Rocky Lang, I, I would say within two weeks as a pitch to Becky Pollock, who was Sydney Pollock's daughter, another great director that I would go on to work with. And, um, and uh, I, they paid me to write the script. I wrote the script. I was really proud of it. They put it into turnaround, which means we ain't making your stinking movie. So it kind of died. And uh, I got called into a meeting with Tony Scott, who, who directed Top Gun. Um, they were doing an airplane movie. And so the, I got called in. And on the way out of that meeting, there was a young woman who was the, who they called them the D girls, the development girls back in those days. And uh, she was a really nice young woman. And I said, hey, listen, uh, I, I just wrote this script. Maybe you'd like to read it to just kind of see what I do. And she said, yeah, absolutely. So I give it to her and I leave. And I end up in Colorado with my parents-in-law. They were celebrating their 50th anniversary. I'm fly fishing on some creek. And my wife pulls up in the car and says, I have two things to tell you. First, we're having a baby. And the second is Ridley Scott wants to make your movie. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't even know Ridley Scott. What are you talking about? So what happened was Tony and Ridley had a company together. That young woman read the script. Ridley was making another movie with Jodie Foster and, and Robert Redford that collapsed. And he's storming around his office, completely furious. And this woman says, I just read this script. It's pretty good. And he snatched the script, went into his office, slammed the door, came out an hour or two later, threw the script on her desk and said, find him. <laughs> this is my next movie. And, and I'm in the middle of nowhere. This is kind of pre-cell phone. And they couldn't find me. And for like three days, they're thinking that I'm selling this movie to someone else. They made up this story. <laughs> and so I, when I finally, they finally found me, they're like, you need to get on a plane now and come back to LA. And I've been burned so many times that I just went, you know, I'm not coming back. I'll come back on Monday when I'm supposed to come back. And they're like, no, 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 you got to come back now. And I'm like, nah, I'm not doing that. So on Monday I showed up, they sent a car for me to the airport, took me to a restaurant where Ridley and his producer, Mimi Gitlin were waiting for me. And he, and it happened just like that. He, and the whole time we're talking, he's drawing on a napkin because he's an amazing artist. And he ends up holding, at the end of the meeting, he holds up the napkin. And it's this picture of the wave breaking over the ship, capsizing it. And I'm like, yeah, all right. I, I think he'll do. <laughs> that's awesome. But it, it's amazing. I mean, that's really how my career got kickstarted, you know, and it was all kind of because I said no you know, and they got all wrapped up in it and turned out great. So. Awesome. Chief, I have a question from Tony who says, what director of photography that, in who's the director of photography that inspired your shooting style? Wow. That's a great question. Nestro, um, gosh, there's so many that you, you, you kind of caught me on the spot. I'll tell you this, um, my DP Byron Werner and I 
sit down and we'll watch lots of movies all, all across the spectrum to try to figure out what it is that we're trying to um, deliver in terms of content, uh, emotionally, uh, what is the information, what is the scene really about. We spend many, many hours talking about these things and then looking at examples of other people's work. And I don't, I don't think you can't not, you know, look at the work of the 70s and see how lighting changed and it went from being front lit. Like, for instance, right now, you guys are all pretty front lit and I'm pretty side lit. And side lighting, three quarter backlight uh, is much more interesting to me because it makes you look into the shadows to try to find the mirrors of the soul, right? Um, and in the old days, you know, when we were using Technicolor film that was really slow, you had to pump all this light into the shot to, just to expose the film. And now, the, obviously we're into the age of digital, but even at the beginning of my career when we we're still shooting on film, um, the stocks got so fast that you could introduce less and less light and you could work with shadow more. Mm. And so uh, to, to me, it's, it's usually about uh, trying to make the audience participate a little bit by digging the story out as opposed to just putting it in their face. And then the other part of cinematography is, is lensing. Like what, what are the, the lens choices that you're gonna use? which sadly a lot of times comes down to how much time you have. Mm -hmm. Because if we, um, this is a little in the weeds, but if we had our choice, we would always be on a prime lens and we would move the camera rather than zooming in. Sure. But it takes time to change lenses and to re reboot the camera. So a lot of the time we get stuck, you know, with a zoom lens, which really changes the, the focal length changes, the backgrounds go soft mm -hmm. and you really want to be deliberate when you're um, when you're making these choices, because it all unconsciously means something when you're uh, when the audience is experiencing it. And the third thing is how are we moving the camera? And I always want the audience to be uh, unaware that 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 there is a director or that there is a cinematographer. Mm -hmm. I want them to ju just be having a holistic experience as opposed to. Um, you know, sitting there and going, oh, I mean, I always think of a shot in that every young filmmaker stole back in the day from Martin Scorsese, the, the great uh, Copacabana scene in uh, Goodfellas, where it's, it's one shot that goes all the way through the basement and the kitchen of the, the Copacabana and, and lands in the, in the actual, uh, uh, whatever it is, the dining room. And um, everybody like just copied that for a long time. And, uh, but I I'm always so aware of the camera and aware of the filmmaker mm -hmm. that it takes me out of the story. So what I really am looking towards when I'm looking at, um, at cinematography is where is it that I become unaware that I'm watching it anymore and just am having a personal experience with the movie. So those are the things that I look for. That's, wow. that's intense. I just learned so much. I like my mind is blown right now. And you know, you, you, you know that, right? Cause when you see a movie, you feel like, you know, you're, you're kind of in a, in a different world, right? And that's the intent, like you're in it. You feel like you're there with the, with the characters and, and all the detail you just brought side lighting, front lighting, none of that even crossed lenses and, and right. focusing on, never quite. I thought you just put a camera up, put it down. Hey man, say these words, let's go. And you just record, but it's so much more. <laughs> yeah. So much more fascinating to hear all that. Yeah, and we all feel overwhelmed by it, you know? I mean, it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. Day one on a shoot always feels, um, always feels like you're doing it for the first time. Excellent, yeah, thank you so much for providing all that interesting perspective, um, things that we don't see from just a normal, normal view. Todd, where can viewers go to watch The Last Full Measure and where can we find you online on social media? Well, you can find me uh, on uh, Instagram, although I'm not really that uh, active being an old dude. Um, TikTok, but I'm there. On TikTok. I'm there. I'm the, I'm the Todd Robinson with a little blue check. Um, and you can, uh, you can find us, uh, if you just Google Facebook and look for The Last Full Measure, there, there are uh, several fan sites and our official site. Um, you can find the movie on all the major platforms. Um, you can always rent it on iTunes. Uh, it's on Prime. It's on Netflix, I believe, right now. 
Uh, you can buy the DVD uh, at all of the brick and mortar stores. You can order it uh, on Amazon. Um, I think it would be impossible not to find it at this point. I, I watched agree. it I found on it, Prime. I found yeah. it last night on demand uh, on my AT&T. Four there bucks. Quick watch it. <laughs> Right on. It was a good film, though. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. I was, I was, I was impressed. Thank with you. The story, everything. Yeah, there were some good scenes. Maybe a little tearjerker. I think Julie cried. Mm -hmm. I, I always cried. cry. I did. I did. I cried really hard at the end. And my husband's like, "Are you okay?" I'm like, "Just watching this movie." And it, yeah, it was really good. I really, I, it was a good cry, though. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's it's inspirational. Yeah. It's a, it's a little sad, but it's really uh, tears of inspiration. And if you don't cry in this. I think you, you have work to do. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching it with my wife, so I just had like a tear. Yeah, yeah I know. Uh -huh. It's no. so funny. We know we yeah. always the filmmakers always sit in the back of the of the movie theater when these things are going on, and yeah, and you see the guys kind of going, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're always like, trying to. That's trying me. To cover it up. <laughs> Chief yeah. being the tough guy. <laughs> oh, I'm just tired. I'm just tired. It's, it's not, okay, it's Chief. Not it's okay. We know you're a, a softy down deep. <laughs> He is a softy, and I think also your comments on lighting. We're probably gonna get calls from our bosses asking us to do like, what did you call it? Three quarter lighting. Now they're always Back. trying to get three quarter to side lighting. Quarter side lighting. So, hey, ladies, you look fantastic. Clearly, you've got your little ring lights up, or something's going on. <laughs> <laughs> he could tell. He could tell. He's good. Oh, he's good. Busted. Busted. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> hey, why not? <laughs> I mean, you can awesome. look like them or you can look like me, right? So. <laughs> Chief, I think you started something with the sweet or salty comment. We have always get the raisinettes from Tim Meyer and peanut M&Ms mixed into hot popcorn. That's the best. What? Peanut M&Ms mixed That's into hot popcorn? That's from Jose Martinez. Jose Martinez. What? That. Mm. that sounds weird, Jose. I'm, I'll sorry, try it out. Jose. Sorry. Have you ever had that, Todd? Oh, well, I think Eminem. Jose knows my daughter. She introduced me to that. Yeah, that's really Was it good. good. Oh yeah. Mm. All right. Hey, if Todd approves Jose, I guess it's 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 good to go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Todd. Dumb question. I'm just gonna ask a crazy question. Do you and like all these big time directors go like to speakeasy and like smoke cigars and drink some <laughs> bourbon and talk about movies? How, how does that work? Cheap. Well, I gotta say, uh, I, I, I it's hard for me to turn down a nice glass of scotch. I'm not a cigar guy, um, but I know a lot of people are. are. Um, I just uh, I, I just feel like my mouth is a runway after I smoke a cigar for like a week. So uh, I'm not a cigar guy. Um, but uh, no, you know we um, you know we, we we get together. But I'll tell you this, you know Clint Eastwood said it, and I I think it's true. The real secret to directing is stamina. And so when I'm actually working on a movie. Um, the second we wrap, I used to, because I'm so, I so love being on set, but um, in, when I was young, I used to stick around. And, but what I realized is if you stick around, people start asking you questions. So now I, I'm, the second we wrap for the day, I race out of there so nobody can ask me anything. And I, I go to bed early, you know, I, I usually have to answer email and so forth. I go to bed early, I get up, I meditate. Um, I, and I, to tell you the truth, when I'm working, I don't drink um, at all um, because it's just too hard to get up. You know, our, our hours are too crazy. So uh, you got to take care of yourself physically, spiritually, um, you know, to get through it because it's, it's really hard work. And, and if I go down, if I get sick, everything stops. I mean, everybody else can be sort of scheduled around, but if the director goes down, you got a problem. So um, it, it's really, you know, it's boring, but it's my responsibility to keep myself well. Wow, thank you, Todd. Todd, any last words for the audience out there? Anything that you want them to know before we wrap this up? Well, I hope that everybody can get a chance to see the, the film. We, we really made this for the military community uh, to honor all of you and all of your sacrifices, uh, additionally to the, to the uh, civilian community so they could maybe get a little bit of insight into uh, you know, what it means uh, to be in the military and to, to give such great sacrifice. Um, and uh, I just wish everyone well. I hope you all have a safe and healthy uh, Independence Day celebration. And uh, thank you so much for having me. I, I, I'm honored to be able to speak to your audience.
Well, thank you, Todd. Stick around after we're done here. Todd, thanks again for spending time with the Exchange family today. We appreciate you and your support of our airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, Coasties, family members, retirees, veterans, everyone out there. Thank you so much. Julie, Leah, out. See you soon. Dallas out. Dallas Bye. out. <laughs>